Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really good to be with you today, uh, not least because I know exactly where to come to. Uh, I've been out and about the diocese a little bit, and some of the places are really hard to find. The worst one, and Lorraine will bear witness to this, is Bally Scullion. And Johnny was going there this morning for their service. So Bally Scullion is right out at the, the top end of the diocese uh, near Randallstown. My sat nav decided it was going to take me into Derry and Rafaud diocese uh, over the uh, over the river, other side of Macra Felt, and I got there very late. So hopefully Johnny is better at navigating than I am. Sorry, Johnny's better at navigating than I am before Lorraine takes over and gets me to the service. But it's, it's really good to be here with familiar faces and uh, to worship together. If any of you don't know me, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm reader in the parish here. And because Johnny is exercising his rural dean duties today up in Randallstown, uh, I'm down here. So uh, it's good to be here. I have a few announcements. I'm going to get them out of the way at the start because odds are at the end of the service, I'll forget about them and some are quite important. So there are a few booklets down at the back with the announcements in them. Or if you speak to David, he'll be happy to add you on to the email list so you can get them popping into your inbox uh, every day. Okay, the next slide is really important. Ah, there we go. There are details in here as well uh, on how you can get your consent forms in for any children who are in our uh, programs. BB is separate, but for anything else, you need to sign uh, consent forms for your kids to go along, and those have to be done. Uh, there will be a baptism service here in two weeks' time. And this is going to cause confusion. There will be no service in Christchurch, and the service here will be at 11 o'clock. So the folks in Ballyneur have got an hour to make their way across. If you turn up at half 11, everybody's going to turn around and look at you. But that service will be at 11 o'clock. And because it's a big celebration, we're going to have some refreshments afterwards. And if you're able to provide a dessert, please sign up at the back. Uh, so that we can get some desserts and uh, to celebrate that. Uh, there is a collection at the back as well for Green Island Parish. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that two weeks ago they suffered an arson attack and the bishop has asked that uh, each church in the diocese has a collection just to help get some money together to help them rebuild and uh, to, to get back on their feet again. Uh, also, there is a birthday concert on the 28th of September for New Irish. The booklet is out of date. So David messaged me yesterday. This is saying that uh, tickets are priced at £30 each. They're now down to 25 Before there's a riot, anyone who has already purchased the tickets will get them for the £25. But if you could see David by tomorrow, if you would like to go to that. And there are lots of other things here that I won't go into. So, so either lift this or sign up. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit is in every square inch of the universe. And that you are here, that you were here before us. And we pray, Lord, that you will prepare our hearts and our minds and that everything that is done in this service will be towards your glory and point us towards knowing you in a better and more real way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Chris, over to you. Good morning, folks. Would you like to stand? my soul the king of heaven to his feet I tribute bring ransom till restored forgiven who like me is praying 
stepped out into darkness, opened my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of the light spread with you. So here I am to about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, and it's appropriate that we should come to him and confess our sins. He died so that we could be forgiven, and we need to come before him regularly to confess our sins and receive that forgiveness. So we'll pray together. The words will appear on your screens. If you move on to the next one, please, Graham, for Heavenly Father. Oh. Sorry. Go back one. That's you. Sorry, this is a different, uh, a different confession to the one that Johnny sent me on Friday. So I'll go by the screens as well. So we'll pray together. Holy God. Holy God, we have disobeyed your commandments. We have resisted your call. We have failed to live by your generous love. We are sorry for all our sins and ask you to forgive us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who has called us, is faithful and will not remember our sins. Our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Live by the Spirit's transforming power and forgive as you have been forgiven. Amen. It is really special to be in a church which is filled and which has so many young people in it. Uh, I have spent a, a number of weeks over the summer going around the diocese and taking services, and there is nowhere that I have been which is as full as this or has as many young people, and it is a huge blessing to have all ages in our service to worship as a family together. So, uh, kids, young people, it is absolutely fantastic to have you here. 
You're now going to go out down to the hall for your part of the service. You're probably going to have more sweets and more energetic songs and actions than I can cope with up here, certainly. But as you go, let's just pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you that we have so many children and young people and families and people of all ages worshipping together. You took children and welcomed them and put them on your knee and blessed them. And I pray, Lord, that as these children go down, that you will bless them, that you will bless the people who lead them, that you will give them energy, and that these very special members of your church can come to know you early in their lives and serve you for a lifetime. In Jesus' name, amen. Pam is now going to come and give us our Bible reading. The reading is from uh, Mark chapter 8, reading verses 27 to 38, and can be found on page 1012 of the Pew Bible. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But who do you say, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by his elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns the way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Pam. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're looking at a passage where you spoke to your disciples. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to us as your disciples in this time and place today, and that we will hear your words and be changed by them. In Jesus' name, amen. For many years now, I have been working in environments where I meet members of the public every day. Sometimes that can be really rewarding, but it isn't without a whole lot of challenges. Quite often, the people that I meet are delightful, and they're very grateful for anything I can do for them, but others are much more demanding. And I have to say, I find it very difficult to work with somebody who sees themselves as a step above me, or more likely a flight or a couple of flights of steps above me, and who feel that I'm just there to meet their demands, regardless of who might be ahead of them in line or who may have a greater need. The ultimate horror, though, occurs when you hear someone announce 
usually at the very top of their voice, do you know who I am? That pronouncement can make my blood run cold. On one memorable occasion, I had a middle-aged lady who was very insistent that I would do something for her. And not only was it not possible, it was downright illegal. And I explained that to her, and she pulled out the card of, do you know who I am? And then she followed it with the the up-leveling of, I'm very good friends with your boss, and I will make sure he knows how you're treating me. I phoned my boss, Tim, to let him know there would probably be a complaint on its way, so that hopefully he would be prepared and could head it off at the pass. And his response was that he had absolutely no idea who this woman was. She clearly had a very inflated sense of her own importance. In our passage today, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Jesus isn't in any way being arrogant. He's not trying to get the disciples to build up his ego, but he wants to see how normal members of the public perceived him and who he was. He wants to see if they understand his mission. And indeed, he wants to know if his disciples are really clued in as to who Jesus was. It's a bit surprising to hear some of the answers. Some people apparently felt that Jesus was John the Baptist, which is pretty illogical because John the Baptist baptized Jesus in a very public ceremony. They were both in the public eye at the same time. Other people thought that Jesus was Elijah, the spirit of the prophet come back. But John the Baptist was the firebrand preacher whose ministry echoed Elijah's. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, Jesus was a lot less incendiary. He healed people, he fed the sick. And still other people thought that Jesus was another Old Testament prophet. And very clearly, they were on the wrong track. Jesus then asked the disciples who they thought he was. I imagine he could have been preparing for another disappointment where the disciples answered that he was a carpenter, he was from Nazareth, and his parents were Mary and Joseph. But for once they got the answer right and said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. They knew that he was the long prophesied son of God. He's the king that the nation of Israel had been waiting for for so many generations and that he will ransom the Israelite nation. But they still have things confused. And Jesus tells them that they're to keep this quiet. It's easy to wonder why. Jesus had a really public ministry. He fed large crowds, he healed the sick, he made the blind see, and he made the deaf hear. Why would Jesus want his true identity to be kept quiet? A secret is defined as something you tell one person at a time. If you're arranging a surprise party for someone, you don't tell that person until the time is right. Otherwise, the surprise will be spoiled. And in much the same way, the people were not yet ready for the way in which Jesus was their Messiah. They wanted him to be a king, to be a warrior, and to be a military leader who would strike against the occupying Roman forces and bring Israel back to its glory days. And Jesus teaches them that his path would be very different. He would suffer he would be rejected, and he would die. Peter tries to take Jesus aside, 
Peter always gives me a whole lot of hope. Peter was the rock on which Jesus built his church, but he could be so dim on so many occasions. And he tries to tell Jesus that Jesus has got things wrong, that he wouldn't need to go down the road of suffering and death that was ahead of him. And Peter wanted to join the crowds of the public with all of their misconceptions about Jesus and force him to be something that he wasn't. Jesus, despite Peter being one of his closest friends, threw him away and told him, get behind me, Satan. Peter was trying to say something that was absolutely against what Jesus was there for. Peter tried to force Jesus into his own image to fit Jesus into a box where he clearly doesn't fit. And although Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah, he had no understanding of who the Messiah was or how he would act to redeem his people. I had a different encounter with a friend of my boss, and it was a different story entirely. And it would have been about 25 years ago when I came out of work in the dark. Now, this morning, Lorraine's laughing because she criticizes my reversing skills all the time. Uh, I'm not that bad. I did try to run over uh, David and Peter in the car park this morning. I tried three times and couldn't get them, but generally I get there. But I was coming out of work, it was dark, and I hopped into the car and I was going to collect the boys from my mum and dad's, where they normally stayed. Halfway through the manoeuvre, I realised that Lorraine had already collected them and I changed direction and reversed into a big car that I hadn't seen in the car park. It wasn't really obvious who that car belonged to. It was quite a small car park. All the shops beside it were closed. There were a number of houses around, but I didn't know who it belonged to. And a man was walking past and I asked him. I explained what had happened and it was his car. So I apologized, told him where I worked and he said he'd have a look in daylight and get back to me. And then he said that he was a friend of my boss. Great. He never came in to me to get the damage sorted out and I didn't know his name or what house he lived in. So I left it a few days and I had to phone Tim and explain the whole sorry story to him. And when I told him, he said, oh yes, I know him. He lives in number seven. He's a policeman. I thought, great. So I had uh, the whole sad story of reversing into a car, getting told I was a numpty by my loving wife, having to tell my boss, and then finding it was a policeman. I made contact with him. And this really kind guy said that there was very little damage. He wasn't worried about it and just forget about it. He couldn't have been more of a gentleman. Now, six months later, he ended up on our work night out go-karting. Uh, I looked behind me and he was there with his helmet on with a big grin on his face and he gave me a rough time. But he was an absolute gentleman. Out of these two people that I encountered... One of them knew my boss, one didn't. One of them was able to demonstrate that they knew Tim's name, but the other showed that they knew him as a person. The policeman whose car I reversed into acted with integrity and with far more grace than I deserved. The entitled woman didn't. One of them was authentic, but the other just knew some words to say. The challenge for us today is this. Who do you say that Jesus is? We're sitting in a church. We're part of the Church of Ireland and part of the wider Anglican Communion. Shortly, we'll say the Apostles' Creed where we claim to believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And many people still bow their heads when Jesus is mentioned in the Apostles' Creed. 
But do you know Jesus as a word, as a name, as a concept, as the name that bequeathed the title to the, the Christian church? Or do you know Jesus as a person? Do you spend time in his presence in prayer and Bible study, trying to learn about him and coming to know him more? Do you strive to model your life on him? Many people come to church. Many people will tick the box in census forms saying that they are Christians. But they have a twisted view of Jesus. They see him as a talisman, someone they can pray to when they're in trouble, but not as a person. They may see Jesus as a historical figure who had some good teachings, but they choose which of those they want to follow. And they twist the words of Jesus and use them to back up their own opinions. They know the name, but they don't know the Saviour. How do we move from knowing the name to knowing the person? Well, Jesus gives us the pattern. We need to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow him. Warren Wearsby classifies that as surrender, identify, and follow. We have to give up on our, our own desires to put Jesus in a box that we have designed. We have to realize that he is God, that he is in control, and we need to hand ourselves over to that control. We have to identify with him. Jesus went to the ultimate length of suffering and death to bring us to him. And we have to be prepared to put our own needs last, to follow in his path, and to seek ways in which we can share him with the people around us. And we need to follow him. A one-off action does not make someone a disciple, someone who follows Jesus. Jesus didn't just state that he would die. He went down the path of suffering and he went through the whole horrific process. Following Jesus is a process which continues through the entirety of our lives and well beyond. Jesus absolutely achieved his objective. He died and rose again, and he has purchased salvation for us. Our objective is to surrender our own lives, to identify with him and to follow him so that we can receive the well done, good and faithful servant as we enter into glory. Finally then, do you know him or do you know him? Who do you say that Jesus is? Let's pray. God of mercy, help us to forgive as you have forgiven us, to trust you even when hope is failing and to take up our cross daily and follow you in your redeeming work through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Michael. So that challenge, who do you say Jesus is? Let's hope the next song is your, is your, is your response and you can sing this from your heart. Let's stand.
Creed. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sit as we pray together. And we pray the words which Jesus taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and ever-loving God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us, that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill them, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Lord God, we pray for the world you have given to us. We have failed to be good stewards of the bounty you provide, and often our brothers and sisters across the world suffer because of our overconsumption in the developed world. Forgive us and show us how we can address these inequalities and the issue of climate change. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You know when a sparrow falls to the ground and you know each hair on our heads. 
Lord, you care passionately about all people, those who know and love you, those who don't know you yet, and those who are antagonistic. We live in a world where strong forces wage war on weaker neighbours, where children are facing polio in Gaza and slaughter continues in Ukraine. Move your mighty hand to protect these innocents and strike down warmongers who destroy lives for profit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own country where the cost of living increases are making life difficult for many. We pray for our government and ask that our leaders may make wise, just and honourable decisions which will benefit the people that they are elected to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, not for buildings or organisations, but for the people who love you and serve you across the world. Thank you for the great diversity we see in our brothers and sisters, our family who are praising you today. Bless those who are persecuted. Give them courage and resources to fearlessly proclaim your name in dark places. Let us follow their example, though we don't face the persecution, but so often remain silent when we have opportunities to share the gospel with people around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for our own Diocese of Connor and for George, our Bishop. We pray too for Johnny as he ministers here and with additional responsibilities as Rural Dean. Give them strength and wisdom, encourage them as they lead us, and as they aim to strengthen your church in this place. We pray for all of those who minister in whatever role they serve. Bless them and let them see the eternal results that their hard work will produce in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the parish of Green Island, who celebrated their 70th anniversary with such great joy and then faced the destruction of their buildings through arson. Thank you for the support and love that other churches and community organisations have provided. And thank you for the assurance that the believers in Green Island have that they are your church, not the buildings. Give them strength, resources and encouragement as they maintain and strengthen their ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and lonely and bereaved. You are the God of healing and comfort. Step alongside them and give them a true awareness of your presence and of your arms around them. Let's take a few moments of silence to pray for ourselves and those people we love who are facing hard times. Heavenly Father, accept these, our prayers, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we bring our time of prayer to a close, let's bless each other with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever. up at the front if you want to stay and have a chat and some fellowship. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Praise the Father, praise the Father. 